various places. Cool, so I'm cool. hoping that um, you'll get some folks for that. Sounds so. good. All right. Yeah. Well, okay. Do you have any video or sound? Uh, nope, nope. Okay. I was going to make sure we get that place. Okay. So thanks so much for joining us today. As you all know, because I know all of you guys, but I am Sarah <laughs> Ripp from the Latin American <laughs> Studies <laughs> Program. I'm really pleased you could join us today. And um, I did bring Jacob's bio, but just to give you a quick little synopsis. Um, he's actually a former Lassie's major and also has a degree in journalism from UW. I believe he graduated in 2010, right? right? And then he went on to Columbia University in New York to get your master's in political journalism. Um, political journalism. So he's a foreign correspondent who writes on migration, development, economics, and inequality, foreign aid and investment, governance and innovation in developing nations, um, his current work focus focuses on East Central Africa, the Caribbean, and Germany. Um, his, his work has appeared in the New, the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, which actually this topic that he's going to talk about today was featured in, was it just an online version or was it a print Yeah, it was version? a web feature. Not just, but it was, yeah, a, yeah. It was a web, Not quite in the print a web yet. featured article um, in National Geographic recently. Uh, Foreign Policy, Wired, Newsweek, The Associated Press, um, Guernica Magazine, etc. And several of his investigations have been supported by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. So um, I'm just really pleased to have Jacob back. He was here last year and gave a lecture and then also followed that up with a roundtable on careers in international journalism and working in the nonprofit NGO field. We're going to do that again this afternoon at 1.30. So thanks for coming back and joining us today. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And it's 1.30, will be here. 1.30, yep, here. We'll be here. Yep, you can, can just hang you can hang and you can be here, yep. <laughs> yeah, um, hi everybody, I recognize some of you guys, so it's good to see you again. I, I was here about a year ago, it was the last time, and um, yeah, I, I'm looking what forward to- What did you tell us about last year? Last, last time I was talking about Dominican-Haitian relations. Oh, thank yep. you. Yep, oh, uh, which I still am doing sort of more reporting on. It's kind of a big- An island divided or something. Yes, exactly, I think it was called an island divided. Um, I've spent a lot of time over many years, starting with study abroad, actually, in the Dominican Republic in Haiti, uh, back when I was a student here. And so I've spent a lot of time on the island. Yeah, last time we had a discussion about the statelessness crisis on the island. Um, long story short, the Dominican Republic was um, denationalizing people, stripping away the citizenship of people of Haitian descent. So people whose parents, grandparents, etc., came from Haiti, but they themselves were Dominican and Dominican born, but the Dominican uh, government has stripped about 200,000 people of their nationality, so now they're stateless. And so that's what we were talking about last time. Uh, and I guess as an update to that, um, not, not much good has changed in that situation. You actually, since I last spoke, we have now some refugee camps that have popped up in Haiti to house Dominicans, or people who until recently were Dominicans, actually. Um, you know, I mean, you remember that after the earthquake in Haiti, there were all sorts of refugee camps there for Haitians who were displaced by the earthquake. And now, interestingly enough, you have um, uh, Dominicans being deported or uh, deciding themselves to leave out of fear of violence back to Haiti, uh, a country that some of them have never lived in. You know, maybe their grandparents immigrated from there but uh, maybe they don't even speak the language sometimes. I actually got to visit uh, one of these camps. Um, so it's a really serious situation with, with many people moving or being deported from the Dominican Republic right now to Haiti, don't have a nationality, so they're stateless on this two-state island. Um, so yeah, things haven't gotten much better there, unfortunately. Um, and there hasn't been a whole lot of pressure um, to the extent that some people think there should exist some from the State Department, um, the US, which has a, played a big hand in all things Haiti and, and also to some extent in, in kind of behind the scenes in some of the Dominican laws that actually eventually led to this denationalization of people. So um, yeah, no, no good news there, unfortunately. Um, but today, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a different project um, that I've been working on. This was for National Geographic and it was funded by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting in Washington, DC. Um, basically a, a web feature, and uh, an article in photography about this, this kind of mystery in climate science that's occurring right in the Caribbean. Um, yeah, about these essentially uh, two lakes. Maybe I can pull up a map and kind of show what we're going to be talking about. First of all, has anyone, have anyone here who spent time in Haiti or the Dominican Republic at all? Is anyone familiar? You, were, you said you'd visited Haiti a long, long time ago. Okay, anyone else? Um, yeah. Yep, that's right. Great. So I don't know if you guys, pa if, you, if you pass between, um, uh, so obviously we're talking about Hispaniola here. If uh, you pass between Santo Domingo 
and Port-au-Prince, you're actually going to pass these lakes, and on the next slide I'll show you, but there's, there's two lakes. Um, one used to be on the Dominican side, one is on the Haitian side. As you'll hear now, uh, this one is so big, it actually crosses the Dominican side now. Um, let me see if I have a slide of that. Okay, this is a little harder to see, but we're kind of zooming in on the border region. Um, these are the two lakes as they, um, as they are, were recently, as of a few years ago, uh, although they used to be much smaller. So, the lakes that um, we're talking about are, yeah, Lake Enriquillo on the Dominican side, Lake Azue on the, Lac Azue on the Haitian side. Um, and so, again, there's no two maps that show it necessarily, but the main trade route between Port-au-Prince and Santo Domingo passes right around these lakes. Um, and so it's, it's a, like kind of the most key route in the whole island, really, for, for trade, um, really important to both economies. And so I first traveled that road from Santo Domingo to Port-au-Prince in 2007 when I was studying abroad in the Dominican Republic. And um, when I passed through, you know, you go to the border, you get your passport stamped, you get your visa, et cetera. Um, and, you know, continue on. And, you know, I noticed at the time that the water, the lakes were like kind of coming right up to the border uh, the buildings, the immigration buildings, and that sort of thing. Well, when I came back in 2010, three years later, the building where I had gotten my passport stamped was underwater. All you could see was the roof. And this was, you know, I mean, it was a, a one-story, but large-ish one-story building, completely underwater. Um, and then when I passed through again in 2012, the next building that I had then stamped my passport in was also underwater. Um, all from Lake Azue, which was just rising it uncontrollably. So, um, unfortunately, you haven't taken photographs. I do, and so let me show you some photos. Um, yeah, well, these are kind of out of order. I didn't, unfortunately, find my old photographs. But um, this is this is um, this is the um, Lake Azue on the Haitian side as it looks as it looked as a, f a few months ago when I was there. Um, so this is actually a community that never used to be a lakeside community. It was just you know a land. You know, people had farms. Uh, about and then over the course of eight years, uh, a lake that was far away, like Azue, came and engulfed this whole community. And as you can see, this is kind of the remnants of it. Uh, I think it was 86 families that had to move out. I mean, these are their kind of concrete houses that existed there. This all happened in 10 years because these two lakes, um, Lake Azue, it, it rose so much that it, they, geographically ex it expanded immensely. And actually, Lake Enriquillo, which was bigger in the first place, literally doubled in, sur in surface area um, over the course of these eight years, essentially. Um, and so you can just imagine how much land that took over. You know, people who lived way far away from the lake and never thought of themselves as a lakeside community uh, all of a sudden had their houses underwater. So completely unexpected. Um, and so, yeah, as far as photos, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so does that, does that mean that uh, That's a great question. So, um, so the yeah, so the water expanded as you can actually almost see here onto the uh, Dominican side. Um, so, essentially, there's, there's been no cross-government discussion about this. There was there was an agreement that said we're going to talk about this, and they never did uh, between the two governments. We'll get to kind of the lack of of, of um, discussion between the two governments, but essentially. As we'll find out, this caused the fact that the lake went over to the other side causes some problems, um, specifically related to the illegal trade of charcoal. So we'll get to some of the consequences of these lakes rise, but one of them that we'll get to is the fact that people are smuggling tens of thousands of tons of charcoal from the Dominican side to the Haitian side, and now that the lake's here, that makes it easier, because people can just put it on a boat here. You don't have to go through the border, pay bribes, and et cetera, uh, move over land. You can actually just put it on a boat here and take it right over toward Port-au-Prince. So uh, uh, one, of the, one of the effects of the lakes rise. So yeah, I mean, I guess I can just describe a little bit. I mean, these are, these are brackish lakes, which means they're salty, not as salty as the ocean. Um, so Lake Enriquillo on the Dominican side, the, the bottom of it is actually 113 feet below sea level. So it's the lowest point in the whole Caribbean. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of... Um, yeah, it's a big dip, which is interesting because it's not very far from Pico Duarte, which is the highest peak in the Caribbean, uh, the mountain. And so um, also Lake Oswe is also a very low-lying lake. It's slightly above sea level, the, the ground, the, the floor of it, but it's also kind of low-lying, which, which gives you, tells us a little bit about why there's so much water in it or why they exist in the first place. Um, as I mentioned, um, Lake Enriquillo is, 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 is still this community in Haiti that I visited in December. 
Um, but then we get to, this is like in Raquel on the Dominican side, these wooden posts that you see, these were fences that outlined farmland, right? There were people who, you know, they own their land, they put up, you know, uh, palos and, and, and barbed wire and that sort of thing. And so you can kind of see looking way out into the lake, I mean, these were all farms that are just all you see are the tips of the, the fences now. Uh, and again, that's because the Dominican side, it expanded so rapidly. You can see here too, lots of trees that, that you know, be, became submerged and died essentially. The Dominican side, this is actually back on the Haitian side. Uh, Lake Oswe. This is the border road, actually. The road that you see is, is the main road connecting the two. And um, I actually included an anecdote in my, in my article about this. Um, whereas the water kept rising so much that it, at many, many times over the past decade, this road has flooded and the UN or other agencies have had to rebuild the road. And one time it was so flooded that um, it was, you know, you're driving through water and it's hard to see where the lake, where the road ends because you don't see the road, it's just water, and where the lake begins. And one of the guys I interviewed for the story, a UNEP official, actually saw an SUV in front of him tip into the lake uh, on one of these trips, like right in front of him, because you couldn't see where the lake was. So just kind of really, really surprising how much the water has expanded and the problems it causes for this main trade route, which again, isn't paved even 100% of the time, but just filled with trucks all day, you know, carrying, um, Food, you know, clothes and food aid to the Dominican Republic being sold from Haiti, um, chickens being sold to Haiti, and eggs being sold to Haiti, and this sort of thing. Um, very important trade route. Um, let me see if I can find, this is, this is one of the border buildings actually that's now mostly underwater. It was a little uh, stop uh, years ago that I stopped at. Um, and again, so this is the Dominican side. Now, in the past couple of years, the water has receded on the Dominican side just slightly, um, just enough that we can get a glimpse of what it'll look like if it ever comes back to normal. Um, but you can see, I mean, the land, I wish I had another picture, but the land was so rich and green and lush. I don't think I included, unfortunately, those pictures. But now this is what the land looks like once that salt water has receded. And it's salty ground, so you can't immediately start planting again in it. Um, so um, essentially, even if the lake were to, you know, in the next few years, somehow recede, um, this is what the landscape would look like instead of being a lush kind of uh, agricultural rich area that it used to be. Um, so that's part of the problem. Um, and it affects lots of people. 400,000 people live in the watershed of these two lakes. So, so many people um, have been affected by this. Um, from on the wildlife perspective, especially on the Dominican side. Um, the lake here was a tourist kind of attraction. You would go on boat tours, you would see crocodiles, iguanas, all sorts of birds. And uh, there, was an even, there was an island in the middle of the lake that you would go, you could camp at, and you would see all these animals. The island no longer exists, it's, it's underwater. Um, but that means for the animals too, instead of um, crocodiles and iguanas lying there, uh, or, or iguanas, for example, lying their eggs on the island, they got pushed to you know, the mainland, essentially, in which are areas where they're competing with humans. So actually, um, there's a lot of fear, they're studying it now, there's a lot of fear that um, these iguana populations and, and crocodile, crocodile populations are um, decreasing dramatically because people take the eggs or stomp on the eggs or whatever, they're, you know, the animals are going to kind of new habitats that they're not familiar with. So um, ecologically, there's, there's a, I mean, there's a, from the wildlife perspective, there's also a problem. Um, and yeah, from land and a land conflict perspective, um, you know, when all this, this w land is now water, um, there's a lot more fishing, which has led to even more overfishing of both lakes, uh, especially the Lake Oswe in Haiti. I mean, now you just don't, people were telling me you don't find fish larger than this big. I mean, they're, they're, they're practically inedible, but it's a fact of people don't have farmland, many have turned to fishing. Um, and already the lake was overfished, and now it's, it's, that's getting even worse uh, as people, it's, it's kind of their only occupation you can do if you don't have any more land. Um, and so, yeah, and, and you have something like, there's no good estimates, but on both sides of the, uh, of, of the island, you have probably tens of thousands of people who are employed as farmers who no longer have that work. Not all of them are landowners, but you often had big time landowners on the Dominican side who had to lay off all their employees, um, essentially because they had no land to farm. And so you have all these unemployed people, some turn to fishing, some turn to um, other things, um, but maybe one of the other things we, they, that we can talk about that they turn to is charcoal production. Um, so in Haiti, the number one source of cooking fuel is still charcoal, which is produced by cutting down trees, 
um, and creating kind of a, putting all the, the timber under a bunch of dirt and then essentially lighting it on fire. It smolders under um, a pile, a mound of dirt. This is actually a small one, sometimes they're massive. Um, smolders for many days, anywhere from a week to a few weeks. Um, and then it comes out as charcoal, um, charcoal made from trees, and then they can collect, bag up, and then sell to Haiti, so, uh, which is illegal uh, to produce it. It's illegal to cut down trees from the national, from, from uh, I mean, most of the trees that are cut down are on, are on public lands in this area. There's a lot of national parks. So there's deforestation going on, which of course, overall, um, you know, hurts carbon absorption. Uh, and then there's um, the fact of, you know, increased erosion, that sort of thing, because you don't have trees. But then, of course, the burning of charcoal also emits carbon. I mean, charcoal is carbon uh, into the atmosphere. So, um, yeah, this trade, the UN estimates, it's, it's a trade of about one and a half million dollars a year of charcoal from this area in the Dominican Republic now that's going to Haiti. And that estimate was several years ago. It might be much more now. Um, yeah. Good other question. Uh, wouldn't you get more mileage out of it if you sold the wood instead of the charcoal? Interesting. And, uh, yeah. They, they could use that to cook with? So, yes. Um, actually, so I have some friends who actually do research in this area. The thing about wood is it's extremely, extremely heavy and bulky. And so when you, when you turn it, when you carbonize it, essentially you get these little pieces of, think of your barbecue charcoal. If you buy a bag of Coleman charcoal, I mean, that's probably the equivalent of like just a whole bunch of wood. And so just for transportation, um, it's actually far easier. You don't, when you carbonize something, you, you lose some of the energy, but also people don't, people would prefer to cook on charcoal than wood because it, wood doesn't get uh, as hot and as quickly. And you have, um, so like for a lot of reasons, people prefer charcoal and just the transport of heavy wood is, is, is a huge expense, especially if you're trying to get it all the way across the border. As, you know, the, the more bulk you have, the more bribes you pay too, essentially. I mean, if you have to have you know, 10 trucks of wood instead of one truck of charcoal, that's a lot more bribes you're paying at the border to get, to get it through. So it's just, it ends up being cheaper to carbonize it here. Uh, and I've seen this other places in the world too. I mean, for whatever reason, people all, everywhere I've been almost always seem to carbonize the charcoal, even in refugee camps in Kenya. Um, very rarely do I see people there using wood. They, it, it just for transport, I think people carbonize it um, where they cut down the trees because it's heavy lumber. And then, you know, you have these manageable pieces of charcoal that you can then load. Uh, but I think it's economic, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so again, you know, charcoal, I mean, it's $1.5 million of charcoal. It's about 50,000 tons of charcoal goes per year from the Haitian side to the Dominican side. It's estimated and, um, you know, with pretty, pretty dire consequences for the landscape um, and the environment. So let's talk about, I want to talk a little bit about government response to all this on each side. So um, on the Dominican side, we'll start here. So this is the Dominican side. This used to be a town with tons and tons of houses like that, um, called Boca de Cachon on the Dominican side. Um, it was very close to the lake, e even you know, a decade ago. Uh, the lake was very close to it, rather. Um, and actually, I did some reporting here on Dominican-Haitian relations, meeting some Haitian Dominicans here about five years ago. And you know, it was just a normal town that I spent a, a day in just interviewing people. And then I came back in December, and the town is gone. It no longer exists. And so this is an interesting case because the water did not actually flood this town yet. Um, but right across the street from it is the lake. I mean, the lake has come up to the edge of the town. And um, the land that most of these people who had lived in this town owned became flooded. So they no longer had any land. So the Dominican government actually did eventually um, say to the, the hundreds of families that were living in this town, uh, we're going to build you new homes up uh, somewhere else. And they did. Let me see if I have a picture of that. Um, so there's just, there's just this kind of, you know, uh, constructed community, a little on higher ground, maybe a half hour from the old town, where everyone has the same house, the same little plot of land. Um, and everyone in that old town, almost everyone in that old village was given a new house here. Uh, Nuevo. Nuevo, yeah, yeah, Nuevo Boca de Cachon, uh, creative, but yeah, that's the, that's the name. <laughs> And so people moved from here because the fear was the lake, in addition to having already taken their land, that it was on the verge of taking their houses. And it may still be on the verge of taking their houses. Now, um, so some people credit the Dominican government a lot with saying, you know, you, uh, 
you know, re resettled all these people. Uh, and so there's one way to look at it kind of optimistically of at least, you know, they lost their land, there, no, not much land, no farming land was given. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, that's the other side of it. A lot of people from this town criticize the government for not doing more, right? For not saying, for not finding land for them as well. Um, because if you're a farming family, okay, at least you have a home now, but what are you gonna do for your occupation um, as a result of having no land? So kind of mixed feelings about um, how the government you know, went about this, but nonetheless, people were given a new home. Um, and so, on the Haitian side, however, um, this wasn't done at all, and actually very little is known. There's only been really, really one study that interviewed farmers and people on the Haitian side uh, about whether they've lost land, about how the lake has affected them, that sort of thing. And um, that was done quite some time ago already. But we know that many Haitian farmers were affected, but many of these were small-time farmers who were using land that wasn't entirely theirs in the first place. And so they ended up trying to farm on you know, other land that also isn't theirs. And there's uh, apparently just a lot of small scale, but a lot of land conflict over there on the Haitian side. Um, and in the particular village that I visited, you saw those houses underwater. Those particular people were resettled by an NGO, a Christian NGO, um, that built houses for them. They were already working in the area. So, so that particular community, for the most part, most of them were resettled also to houses. But um, on the other side of the lake, uh, which I was not able to get to in this reporting, um, according to surveys and some people I spoke with, there's tons of people who have lost their farming land and some who have lost their homes. And there's just been no kind of Haitian government response to that. Um, so uh, the Dominican side, you have some, some, some government uh, aid, but on the Haitian side, you have nothing. Um, now, to move on, so, so you know, we, we've established that, okay, the lakes are rising kind of uncontrollably, um, and kind of the effects of that, you know, again, being charcoal production, being people out of a job, people out of land, um, the, the perennial destruction of the main trade route between the countries that has to keep being rebuilt so trade can continue. Um, but now I want to get in, just transition a little bit into the, the reason, right? Um, and the whole, my reporting was about, you know, why is this happening? What do we know uh, about why these lakes are rising and what, what isn't known? So um, I think I want to start with introducing the theory that some locals on the Dominican side have and that the Dominican government has kind of adopted as this is the reason. Um, and that is that, um, that the Dominican, the, the Dominican government believes that essentially this is just a matter of a failure in engineering in the sense that the main river, uh, one of the two main rivers in the Dominican Republic, the theory is is just emptying way too much water into the lakes. Now that can be because of erosion, um, because of a lot of tropical storms they've had recently. I mean, there's arguments that in recent years there have been more storms, hurricanes, and things, and so there's just more rainfall, and that therefore the lakes are rising, but largely due to just too much water from the main river called uh, Rio Yaqui draining into um, the lakes. Um, the problem with that theory is that the river does not drain into the lakes. Um, it's not true, but um, speculation is that the reason, um, actually let me I can pull up the map. Oh yeah, this map helps explain the theories a little. Um, this is the river that they're talking about. Um, and their argument is, okay, well the water, it comes down here, and then there's all these little canals, and eventually it drains into the lake. So this isn't, this is kind of a map of the theory, these things, so these are canals that have existed, but don't necessarily exist now. And so that's the Dominican government's idea. Now, the reason this matters to the Dominican government is because if it's a problem of too much water moving too fast on the Yaque, that means it's time to build a dam. And so the Dominican government is building a $400 million dam on the river that is actually going to displace more people than the lake itself has displaced. Um, that's their solution to it, and it's going to their favorite construction firm. I forget the name, but it's a big Brazilian construction firm. So speculation, and I, wasn't, I didn't have the time to completely investigate this, but speculation is that the Dominican government has a very, the executive has a very strong interest in um, believing that this theory is correct. Um, so that they can build this $400 million dam, give it to their favorite um, construction company, this Brazilian company, um, and also, you know, solve the problem if, if they're correct, right? Um, and, and keep the lake from rising any further, uh, or, and, and hopefully get it to start receding if they're able to stop the water from in there. So, but those are the problems with the theory um, uh, that I mentioned. 
Um, and yeah. Also generate electricity. yeah, it is. It is a, yes, it, it, yes, it, it would generate. I think I, I don't know if I wrote down how many watts, but yes, it's it's an electric dam. So you know, and in the Dominican Republic, there is a power. They do have power shortages. It's it's important for that reason. Uh, but four hundred million dollars was estimated to be a lot for the amount of le electricity they, they're creating. I forget the amount, but uh, I have, have I think it's in the article. But um, so, anyways, that's one theory, and, and and part of that theory, and the theory that a lot of locals have as well, is is erosion, right? With all the chopping down of trees for charcoal for farming, that sort of thing. The theory is okay. Well, these lakes are filling up with dirt, and so if you can imagine, if if this is if the floor is the bottom of the lake and it's filling up with dirt, that's actually displacing the water higher, and so that's the argument about erosion is that. You know, if tons of dirt just builds up, the water level also has to go up and get higher and higher. The problem with that theory, it most likely, it, it turns out that the land all around here is, has very little topsoil. It's very deserty, sandy, you hit sand and clay uh, and limestone, uh, spe uh, especially limestone, very soon. So there was never really a lot of topsoil in the first place. So some, uh, sorry, just one second. So, so a lot of people say, okay, it's erosion is the problem, and, and as part of that, you know, fixing, you know, damming the river might, might help reduce the amount of sediment that's going down that river and in, uh, also the amount of sediment that's going into the canals due to agriculture, uh, run, agricultural runoff as well. Um, that's an argument, but again, the counter argument is that um, although there are some, you know, agricultural, you know, areas where you have like, you know, topsoil, especially on this side that's kind of rich and you have some of that, that for most of this area actually on this side, these sides, it's actually um, quite dry, very little topsoil, um, and therefore you can't have that much erosion. There isn't that much dirt to erode in the first place. Uh, yeah. They paid no attention to the rain gauges. To the what? Rain gauges. So yeah, we're getting to so <laughs> rain gauges. That's a, so that's exactly the problem. So, so let me... Um, let me mention one other theory, and then I'll get to that, that problem. So the other theory is that these lakes are actually somehow connected um, underground, because they're not connected overground. And so there's, salty? yeah, they're brackish, which means they're, they're not as salty as the ocean, but they're salty. This all used to be underwater, right? Tectonic plates, like, you know, oh. the island came up. So essentially there was salt oh. left, oh, yeah. Salty. So they're salty. Um, but so it's so some people theorize that there's an underground aquifer somehow where water is draining underground from Lake Oswey, which is a little higher, into Lake Enriquillo. Now that wouldn't solve the problem of well, why is Lake Oswey also rising? Um, but it could describe why Lake Enriquillo has risen even more. Um, that could be part of the complication. But it's very hard to determine that. Essentially, you have to drill tons and tons of boreholes down at different places to determine the. Uh, water level, the underground water level, the water table in this area. So it's something that could be researched, but it would take some amount of money to do it, although certainly not 400 million worth of money as being, as being spent on the dam, but it would take something. Um, and so uh, one other theory that was put out there originally is that the Haitian earthquake had something to do with it. Um, but so little is known about tectonics that it's really just kind of like an idea. There's really no way to know. Um, uh, it's, you know, tectonics, as far as I understand, and as I've studied after the Haitian earthquake, there's so, there's just so much that's unknown about how it disrupts water tables. Um, but also, the earthquake happened in 2010, and the water started rising in 2004, and had already risen significantly by 2008. So um, even if the earthquake in Haiti had something to do with it, it would have only magnified something that was already clearly happening. Um, so these are a lot of the theories. These are a lot of theories that I think are, are, don't quite have it. Um, uh, have it right, but um, getting to the theory that I think ha is, is probably the most accurate is a theory about climate change. And so that theory, uh, which is held and kind of put forth by some Dominican researchers, including the one who I think I have the most faith in, uh, she's been studying this for many years, she has done a lot of research herself in this area, um, and we'll get to actually maybe a slide. Um, yeah, so Yolanda Leon, had, um, someone actually I knew from, uh, she, works, she works in the Dominican Republic for, at a university. She does research as part of university and biological sciences all over the country. But she also works for this big Jaragua group, which is kind of a, the philanthropy arm of like a big um, hotel, casino chain. Um, and they do actually invest a lot of money in, in research and that sort of thing. Um, so she um, hypothesizes this. Uh, as do um, researchers from City University of New York, with whom she's working. Um, they hypothesize that um, with climate change, we've had 
sea temperatures have risen in, the run, in around the Caribbean, this is the theory, um, which means more evaporation from the sea, which means more clouds, which means more rainfall. And when rain, uh, um, there's several mountain ranges on Hispaniola, and it's, it's well known that as, the, as clouds pass through, tons of the rain drops over these mountain ranges. 